Unplugged In. The coronavirus is changing the way people worship and how they pray. At the Vatican, Pope Francis delivers Easter Mass to a mostly empty basilica. Muslims prepare for Ramadan knowing the annual pilgrimage to Mecca is suspended. Jews celebrating Passover hold a traditional Seder, but now the matzah on the table making room for the laptop computer with guests joining by the internet. Is it perfect? No. But we are using technology the best we can. Unplugged in, how the era of social distancing is changing cultural norms and religious traditions. And are researchers any closer to a cure? On the coronavirus crisis, faith and religion. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, coming to you from my home in Washington, D.C. The coronavirus pandemic continues to shape daily lives, not least of which is how people worship and how they pray. Easter is one of the most important holidays on the Christian calendar. At the Vatican, it was celebrated in quite a different way. VOA Sabina Castelfranco reports on Pope Francis's Easter message. With St. Peter's Square empty, Pope Francis delivered his Orbi at Orbi message from the gates of the confession to the city and to the world. His words this year resounded more strongly than ever as he addressed a world he said is now oppressed by a pandemic, severely testing our whole human family. Today, my thoughts turn in the first place to the many who have been directly affected by the new coronavirus. The sick, those who have died and family members who mourn the loss of their loved ones, to whom, in some cases, they were unable even to bid a final farewell. The pontiff praised the doctors and nurses who worked to exhaustion and at risk of their own health, and he declared this year's Easter of solitude should be a contagion of hope. This is not a time for indifference, because the whole world is suffering and needs to be united in facing the pandemic. All the Pope's services during Holy Week were held inside an empty St. Peter's Basilica, with the exception of the Way of the Cross on Good Friday, which took place in a deserted St. Peter's Square. Ten people from Italy's prison system and the Vatican's health services carried a cross. It was a far cry from the traditional Way of the Cross candlelit procession attended by tens of thousands at Rome's ancient Colosseum every year. Romans and the faithful worldwide will not forget this Holy Week easily. The city has no traffic, empty piazzas and no tourists, a surreal scene no one could ever have imagined. Time seems to have come to a standstill at famous Rome landmarks like the Trevi Fountain and the Colosseum, normally bustling with people. In St. Peter's Square, only police officers with protective masks are visible, making sure no one breaks the new rules. Sabina Castelfranco for VOA News, Rome. Disruptions to religious norms prompted the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to issue a warning of potential attacks against houses of worship due to social frictions associated with the pandemic. The warning says DHS has not received any imminent or credible threats, but cites an increase in online hate speech intended to encourage violence to spread hatred. Just getting a congregation together for religious services is still weeks away. Reverend Timothy Cole leads a historic Episcopal church here in Washington, D.C. He was also among the first COVID-19 patients in the nation's capital. I spoke with Reverend Cole about his personal recovery from coronavirus and the impact it is having on religion and faith. So take me back to March 1st. Um, you did services that day, right? Uh, yes, I came back from uh, a conference in Louisville and did some services. Um, and then, the, you know, I felt fine. And then the following day, Monday, I started to feel like flu. Um, so I went to bed and uh, and waited until the flu broke and then waited another 24 hours and then went back to work, felt fine. And then uh, a few days later, I, I went down with that uh, again and that's when they admitted me. How, did, did your uh, family get it at all? Did your wife get it from you? No, both my wife and son were fine. 
And yet, yet during that period of time, you were interacting with them when you were with the flu symptoms. Yes, that's right. How many days did you spend in the hospital? 21 days. Do you have recollection of it or were you that sick that you don't have recollection of it? No, I remember it. Um, uh, it was, um, I had, had quite a bit of oxygen at the beginning, but I was never on a ventilator. Um, so I seem to, um, I seem to get uh, a, a little bit better and then I seem to get worse again. It's just, it's a waiting game because you're waiting to see whether the body's going to improve or not, you know. And uh, but for me, it went up and down a little bit, and it was a so it was quite a long, a long process. I don't um, mean to step on your privacy rights, but did you have like uh, the chloroquine? I mean, there are a lot of medicines that people are talking about. Do you have any medicines that they are are now looking at as possible? Um, yeah, I asked. I I asked to have the um, the anti malarials because I saw a study in France where it seemed to have some good effect. And having spent a lot of time abroad in those countries and taken anti-malarials many times before, I thought, well, you know, if it if it does good, that's great. If it doesn't do anything, that's fine. It's a safe drug, so I asked to have it. Did they? And they actually gave it to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and did you have a Z pack with it, the antibiotic that they they marry these two together or not? Yes, there's another drug that it goes with. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, if could your family visit you while you were in the hospital? Uh, no, they couldn't really. Um, the, Lorraine came up. Um, there was a sort of airlock <laughs> with two glass windows, and uh, she came up, and we were able to kind of talk on the phone and wave to each other through the glass. But that was about it, really. Uh, it's an amazing feeling, you know. Um, you are one day you're going along the kind of highway of life, straight and, and able to do turn to right and left or do whatever you want to do, and then suddenly you find yourself um, shoved into this small dark back street uh, which you've got no choice but to go down and the, you can't turn to left or right and you're kind of just stuck and it's um yeah it's it's it's, it's a strange feeling um so uh do, are you taking any medicine now or are they just telling you to rest um and drink fluids uh, no I, yes i'm just resting and uh um waiting for the for my lungs to heal you know and um there's there's nothing apparently that you can do about that. You just have to let them do it in their own good time. Well, you've obviously done a good job, uh, both in how to physically and also spiritually respond to it. You seem like you're in good spirits and on the road to recovery. Uh, yeah, thank you. I I I, I feel that, and uh, um, I've been most fortunate here. I have been surrounded by so many wonderful people, both the doctors and nurses, the hospital, but also um, the community here who have. Um, been praying for me and uh, and responded to the crisis in an amazing way. Actually, um, people are connecting and people are are. I mean, this this community is stronger definitely uh, than it was before the beginning of this crisis, and it was a strong community then. You did your yes. Easter service online digitally that everyone's uh, doing. That's right, and, and lots of people are doing some similar things. Um, but it's been wonderful how. Um, members of the congregation have have really um, become closer, more connected, and more um, more together. Really, um, and and when we do come back to church, um, it's going to be a wonderful uh, reunion. And, and a, as I say, I think our community will be stronger than it was before it started. And I really hope that's going to be true for communities up and down the country and for the country as a whole. With Easter's arrival comes the Jewish holiday of Passover. The traditional dinner celebrating the Israelites' freedom from slavery in Egypt is open to family, friends, and even strangers. But a new plague marks the holiday this year. I spoke with Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum from New York about how she and her congregants are adapting to the coronavirus pandemic. We had to pivot very quickly to being an online community. But we don't like using the word virtual, as a colleague of mine says, we're still a community. One of the wonderful things about being part of a multi-generational community is that the younger people have really stepped up and have been loving and generous tutors to our older folks. And before my Psalms class for the first couple of weeks, for instance, younger people were on the phone with everybody and on Zoom walking people through the technology to help everybody get up to speed. 
The reality is so many of my congregants are sick or dying or mourning, and we can't go to the hospital to be with people. We can't sit with people in Shiva Minyanim or do funerals in which we're, 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 we're holding the mourners. It's a difficult time in these ways. You know, I, I guess I feel the saddest um, for the people who are sitting Shiva when they're alone. You know, the, yes. the wonderful tradition of bringing food over and people coming together uh, with the family who's lost a loved one. And, you know, for, you know it's a wonderful tradition and to have that uh, sort of stolen from everybody during this time. Well, we like to think of it as it's offering us an opportunity to really uh, develop new ways of thinking about ritual, new ways of thinking about mourning, new ways of trying to be together. And I'm trying to focus for our community on the, what we can learn from these places of isolation and these places of social distancing and not only focus on the negative, which the curses are awfully visible. It's our job, I think, to always look for the blessings that exist in our lives. And I believe that even the most difficult things can make us more deeply human, more open to the light in the world, more appreciative of small kindnesses and generosities. And I think it's our job to learn the things that will only deepen the world and make us a better place. And that's the challenge of being a human being. Looking at other religions, I mean, I suppose you can appreciate the challenges they have with their various traditions. Yep. They've got problems too. I mean, trying to deal with technology in a time of a, of a virus like this, a pandemic. Every one of us is challenged right now. And I think that I learned from my Christian colleagues, from my Muslim colleagues, from my Sikh colleagues, I learned from all different communities who are focused on this one thing. How do we deepen ourselves? How do we build community? How do we not give up or give in? And all religious traditions have uh, this as a teaching within it. And I learned from them all the power of believing in hope. is especially challenging for developing countries. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan is asking for debt relief so Pakistan and other struggling nations can fight COVID-19. Some Pakistani doctors were arrested after protesting a lack of personal protective equipment. Pakistan has more than 5,000 cases of coronavirus. VOA's Islamabad bureau chief Aisha Tanzim says, Trying to cover the story while maintaining social distancing guidelines is a bit like playing a video game. Things are moving from surreal to downright fictiony. Yep, that's not a word. I invented it. The other day, I had to go for a bit of essential grocery shopping. Seriously, it felt like a real-life version of the video game Pac-Man. Every other human on the street or in the shop was out to eat me. To stay alive, I had to stay away from them at all costs. So I zigzagged right to left on the sidewalk, trying to keep my six feet distance away from all passers-by. Inside the supermarket, the game intensified. Every time I saw another customer walking down the aisle toward me, I would turn and walk the other way. If I couldn't find something and the salespeople tried to help me, I would gesture wildly for them to stay away. The mental toll of just that bit of grocery shopping was enough to make me feel physically tired. I have felt less stress traveling through war-torn Afghanistan. Talking of Afghanistan, this is the time when I should have been there. I'm forced to cover from a distance stories that require an up-close look. And that's the biggest dilemma. Millions of people around me are suffering. I need to be telling their stories, the human stories. But I'm more restricted now than I am covering wars and conflict. How do I do my job without putting my health, or more importantly, the health of my crew, at risk? 
yes, we're taking all the precautions, the face masks, the sanitizer, the gloves, but I'm taking my crew out. They have little kids. I grapple with this every day. The guilt is eating me. Aisha Tanzeem, VOA News, Islamabad. According to the Los Angeles Times, new research shows COVID-19 may pose long-term threats to organ function in patients who have recovered. The World Health Organization says 70 vaccines are now in development. I spoke with the president of Regeneron, a science and technology company, to learn more about their latest breakthroughs. Sir, what is it that your company is doing? Okay, we're trying to provide short-term therapeutics that can make a difference before the final answer, which we're all hoping for, which is a vaccine can come along. Of course, we've heard from experts like Tony Fauci and others that it may be a year or two away to get a vaccine. So what can we do in the short term? Um, when you give somebody a vaccine, you're inducing that person to make an immune response against the virus that can fight the virus. That immune response is called antibodies, antiviral antibodies. Well, it turns out that we can make exactly those kind of antibodies outside of the body. And we can purify them and grow them up to large scale and then give them back to people. So it's as if they've been vaccinated, as if they've made their own antibodies, but we provided the antibodies that can fight the virus. Another one of our approaches is directed against the inflammation that people are getting in their lungs that's causing serious lung disease. Uh, that's thought to perhaps be due to too much inflammation in the lungs. One of our drugs blocks that inflammation and we're testing that as well. So if I can dummy this down for someone like me, the first, the first approach um, is basic, well, the second approach is basically like a, like a steroid to reduce the inflammation, to reduce the inflammation. This, the first approach is like a phony antibody. It's not something that the person creates himself, but you artificially create for the person to fight the disease. Exactly. And it's exactly the same antibodies you would make, but you don't have to make those antibodies yourself. So you're exactly right. Kevzara is like a more powerful but more targeted steroid, okay, that targets just the one inflammatory pathway that might be important. And our antibody cocktail approach, as we call it, reproduces exactly the sort of antibodies a vaccine is intended to do, but we can make it much more potently, much more actively, and give it to you so you don't have to be vaccinated. Where are you in the testing? Well, with Kivzara, since it was already FDA approved, and because of this incredible collaboration with the federal and the state government and the FDA and with BARDA, which is the rapid response arm of the Department of Health and Human Service, everybody got together. We got that trial going in record time within a week or two of the Chinese results. Um, and we are in the midst of that trial right now. And we hope within a few weeks to a month or two to have a definitive answer. Does this really work or, or not? With the antibodies, we've been working on that since the first reports started coming out of China that there was this new potential epidemic coming along. Um, and um, those are on, on track to be going into the first human trials by June. How long do trials have to take or how many people do you have to test? There's gonna be three kinds of trials. One is gonna be in people who have never been infected to prove that they can be protected. For example, healthcare workers, people at the front lines, people at high risk show that they can go in to the front lines and they don't have to be afraid that they're gonna catch the disease. That's a prophylaxis, a protection trap. We can go to the people who have early stage of the disease, not yet having lung um, uh, symptoms and, and severe lung disease. We can treat early treatment. And based on the data that we've done with MERS, which was another coronavirus and with Ebola, prophylaxis and early treatment, we have high hopes would be quite effective. But we're also going to do the late treatment study in the patients who have the advanced lung disease, and we're going to see if it can benefit those as well. So there's going to be three separate trials. We would hope if everything goes well, we can be in those trials by June and within a month or so in each of the trials, maybe be getting answers. All right. One last question. If you get the green light, if this all works as, as we expect or we hope, um, how how fast can you manufacture this or get this, deliver this to people? Well, we're working hand in hand with the FDA and with 
other regulators and with the government to free up. We have one of the world's largest biologics manufacturing facilities up in Rensselaer, New York. Uh, and we are trying to free it up and dedicate it entirely to these approaches for the coronavirus. If all goes well, if we continue to get this sort of collaboration and help from all the necessary parties, we may be able to dedicate it completely. So by this summer, we could be producing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of doses per month of this. So we could really make an impact, I think, in this crisis. And of course, not to be a naysayer, but if there's another virus that comes along, you know, two years from now, that's different. If this methodology works where you make these phony antibodies, as I call it, um, that's a game changer for that. Well, the problem is each virus, you need to make specific antibodies just against that virus, just like we did for MERS or just like we did for Ebola and like we're trying to do now for COVID-19. If we're successful here, um, it will just add to our knowledge base. And also every time we do it, we get a little better, a little faster. So it took us nine months to go from starting the project to being human trials for Ebola. It's going to take us about five months for the COVID-19, which is going to be a world record for this sort of thing. And of course, we're going to try to increase our preparedness and our capabilities. So if there's another, God forbid, pandemic, we'll be able to respond even better and faster. Wash your hands with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. Scrub thoroughly for 20 seconds. If you cannot wash your hands, use a hand sanitizer. Taking these steps can prevent not only coronavirus, but also colds and flu and other viruses. In the Middle East, more than 160,000 cases of coronavirus have been reported. Iran remains the worst hit, with over 70,000 cases, followed by Turkey, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Palestinians in the Israeli-occupied West Bank are on lockdown, with at least 250 known coronavirus cases. But health officials there say testing has been limited, and some fear the situation can only get worse especially in the densely populated Gaza Strip, where the health system remains fragile. VOA's Linda Gradstein reports. The Gaza Health Ministry is building a field hospital and two large quarantine facilities for coronavirus patients on the border with Egypt. Ministry officials worry they could soon be overwhelmed. I'm a public health specialist, and what I see is just is just is scaring me because I know that because before this corona issue, we have had this blockade of Gaza for almost 13 years today, and the health system was already fragile with the limited capacity of beds and with limited capacity of equipment and even shortage of staff and the problems that we're facing before. So this is coming on top of a very fragile health system to increase the, the pressure. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that without external support to the health system in Gaza, that things are going to be, there will be a collapse for quite sure. That concern is echoed by the World Health Organization. The Gaza Strip uh, is a very crowded environment uh, that in itself is obviously an environment that would be, you know, conducive to, to a further spread of, of, of the disease. And then uh, we obviously start from a relatively problematic level of the health system. And as I, I said, I mean, there are shortages uh, everywhere from, from medicines to human resources to medical supplies. The Hamas government is disinfecting Gaza's streets and markets, even enlisting help from the Islamic Jihad's armed militia. Mosques have been shut down and social events limited, essential steps for slowing the spread of the disease in a place as overcrowded as Gaza. In Gaza, the capacity, we are more than 5,000 per kilometer square. So the, the overcrowding will let this disease, God forbid, and spread very quickly. For that reason, everybody should stay home at this moment, not tomorrow. Right now, it should start the curfew. Palestinians in the West Bank are also in a 30-day state of emergency, declared by the Palestinian prime minister after Bethlehem announced the first Palestinian cases of the coronavirus and locked down the city's iconic Church of the Nativity. 
The Palestinian Authority is distributing medical and food aid, and the Israeli government is also cooperating with the supply of equipment and know-how. Israel delivered hundreds of medical kits to the PA, enabling observation of the virus. Also, there are joint tutorials and professional medical workshops participated both by Israeli and Palestinian medical staffs, where they are given the knowledge regarding the virus and proper tools in dealing with it. They often don't agree on much else. But Palestinians and Israelis recognize that the coronavirus knows no borders and, in this instance, are acting in solidarity to prevent its spread across their borders. Linda Gradstein for VOA News in Jerusalem. Coronas has been slow to spread in Africa, but cases there are now rising quickly. South Africa, Egypt, and Algeria currently have the most confirmed cases. Immigrants from Somalia are clustered in the U.S. city of Minneapolis, where everyone is staying home, keeping their social distance. One Somali restaurant owner is trying to make a difference. He spoke with VOA's Somali service. Plugden's Mil Arsega narrates. With most of the city's businesses on coronavirus lockdown, Minneapolis restaurant owner Abdirahman Kahin is keeping his kitchen open to help feed people in need. Kahin says small businesses are rising to the challenge at a time when they're most affected by the shutdown. We close uh, most of our restaurants and the only business we're doing is like a to go and that's like a, not even one fifth or one sixth of our business. So therefore uh, we are helping the community and because God, uh, you know, Allah gave us uh, what we have. So we have to always uh, try to help you know, the, the community. Kahin and his volunteers are helping older members of the Somali community and their neighbors, along with disabled Minnesotans who are stuck at home because of the virus. I used to exercise by walking outside around my neighborhood. Now, due to the stay-at-home order, I cannot go outside. I feel restricted, and it has affected me greatly. I feel like I am in jail in my home. Restaurant manager Isis Sisko says the free meals are a personal connection at a time of social distancing. We know that food comforts everybody, so we're taking the time out to make individual meals for each one of them, you know, just to kind of give them some comfort because our food is comfortable. Afro Delhi volunteers brought lunch to Ramola Madsen. I am so grateful to have somebody bring me something nice to eat. Yesterday, after people came and offered this, I closed my door and I went inside and cried because it's such a kind, sweet thing to do. Kahin says he knows the free meals are not enough to help everyone in need, but he hopes it helps start a broader private sector response. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so this community needs our help. And as a business owner, as a small business owner, we are community business, and we always make sure to respond when the community needs us. Kahin says it's up to local businesses and volunteers to help support public services that may be stretched thin by the virus. For Ahmoud Muscade in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Milar Sega, VOA News. Before we go, an update on another deadly outbreak, one the World Health Organization believed was finally receding, Ebola. The Democratic Republic of Congo had gone almost seven weeks without a single reported case of the virus until last week. That's when health officials reported two new deaths in the eastern city of Benin. The first, a 26-year-old electrician. The second, an 11-month-old girl. Both had been treated in the same hospital. Until these two cases, the WHO had been preparing to declare the end to the second worst Ebola outbreak in the region. That outbreak, which we covered here on Plugged In, has killed more than 2,200 people since August of 2018. That's all the time we have for this edition of Plugged In. We will continue to follow this crisis, but for the latest updates, please visit our website at voanews.com. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being Plugged In. We hope to see you again next week.